thank you very much. It's uh, good to be back, even if it's just a virtual visit. And uh, thanks very much uh, for the inter introduction there, Dave. So um, uh, I can hear you OK. <clears throat> and if there are questions when we get done, then um, I should be able to hear those questions. I just have to turn my uh, speaker up and down a little bit. So <clears throat> if uh, if you all are ready to get uh, started, I think we're ready to do that now. And um, uh, so is the uh, volume good on your end now? Everyone can hear. I hear. I see the nods. So we're good. All right. Good Sounds morning. good. Um, so uh, the <coughs> subject is water stress management technology. We've introduced uh, new sensors that are being used for uh, resolving water issues. <clears throat> and uh, let me, let's see, I have to go. All right, so uh, water is the problem, and uh, what our tools are able to do is to be able to tell you when to irrigate. Uh, we'll be able to tell you how much to irrigate. And uh, these are tools that will uh, help when water is scarce. We know that pumping costs are up, and everybody's trying to uh, conserve water. So the uh, new solution that we have is an integrated solution that allows these uh, advanced sensors to basically talk to you and give you sap flow information, which is the water use of the plant. So basically, we're saying that the plants talk to you. So in, on our agenda is uh, we're going to talk about uh, monitoring plants for stress monitoring, uh, telling you what's different about this approach, and to be able to give you a, uh, a new technology for growers to use to be able to manage water. So if you have the right data, you'd be able to manage the amount of water that you apply so as not to waste water, and to be able to give you uh, stress methods that would allow you to be able to match what the plants need or actually to give them less water if they're able to produce more and therefore gain irrigation uh, water use efficiency. So this is a uh, chart that comes from the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization and it shows a, a, a an ET, that's evapotranspiration, that's E for evaporation, T for transpiration. And this is the actual formula that's used by many of the, uh, well, in CIT and many of the growers uh, that are using this formula to be able to tell uh, when to irrigate and to do it on a planned schedule. Uh, however, as you can see, it's a, it's a multiplier. This KC is a multiplier that's used to multiply times the ETO. Uh, the ETO is a, uh, for example, an evapotranspiration uh, uh, based on weather that is supplied by, for example, the CIMIS uh, weather stations. The CIMIS weather stations are supplied throughout California to be able to calculate this uh, coefficient. Well, this coefficient ETO applies to turf grass. And so to be able to use that, you have to use a multiplier like a KC initial during the initial part of crop development. As the crop grows, there's a lot of variability there. And then you get to a middle coefficient. And then we have an ending coefficient. And these depend on the days of planting. They depend on the species which can be somewhat undefined. There's so many different types of crops out there, different varieties. And it also depends on the soil type, which might be uh, somewhat undefined. If you've done a soil survey, you know it varies a lot. And it can uh, depend on the irrigation efficiency, so the type of uh, sprinklers that you're, that you're using, also the amount of water that actually hits the ground, so, but any, in any case, determining this is quite a trick in some applications. 
Uh, so the next step is, well, how does SAP flow help you? Uh, so this is a chart that shows SAP flow, which is the water movement from the roots up through the trunk of the plant and out through the leaves. And that's where it's transpired itself. And there is some that's evaporated. So this chart shows, well, quite a bit of detail. But basically, at the leaves, you have the um, uh, xylem uh, sap flow, and you also have stomates where water actually goes out. So that's where the um, carbon dioxide goes in. It's absorbed by the plants. And the um, uh, water goes out during that same process of photosynthesis. And also, of course, this transpiration keeps the plants cool so they can uh, survive the heat that we have these days. So xylem is actually the water flow of the, um, of the sap or water as it goes through the plant. And that's where we're measuring sap flow. Uh, so, um, I have um, one example here. Sap flow is a response to the plant environment. So, as the plant responds, it responds to heat, it responds to the solar energy. Uh, it does depend on the soil status, how much water there is, what's the, the, the health of the plant, and uh, what's the status of the plant. So really, it's basically a measurement of all the things that are involved for the plant to produce. So here I have a sap flow chart. You probably can't read that on the side, but it's actually in gallons per day. And it shows two different sets of plants. And these are the almond plants, almonds as we call them in, in Fresno. <laughs> so almonds uh, uh, use between 25 to 75 gallons per day. And those are the, the two charts here, this uh, black is the is the one chart that we monitor at the UC Fresno, and the uh, green is the uh, other side, which I believe would be the um, uh, eastern side of a crop that's uh, grown on the university uh, uh, orchard there. And we also show in the ET, and you can see that ET is very low at this day, so we have a low sap flow, and then it increases almost times uh, two or three times that and you can see the sap flow increase. So this is a cool day. It happened on July 2nd. I believe that was the only cool day of the entire summer. <laughs> so uh, you can see the response, and that was in uh, uh, 2015. So here's how we measure it. Uh, here's the sap flow sensor itself. It's uh, mounted on the trunk of the stem, and uh, it has a heater element that's shown here, and it also has thermocouples. So it's temperature sensors that are required to measure the heat or the energy balance as the uh, water goes through the stem. It actually removes some of that heat and it increases in temperature. So we'll uh, show you just a little bit more about that. All right, so here is the uh, 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 sap flow uh, sensor with a little heat chart on it. And we can see that uh, as the water moves up the stem of the plant, uh, there's some radial heat that's lost. And what we're trying to measure is the sap flow heat gain. So that's the heat that's carried by sap. And then we monitor the temperature sensors below and above this heater strip. So that technology has been around for a little over 25 years. Uh, Dynamax has patents on this. And this uh, current patent that we're showing here has, uh, is showing is our exoskin sap flow sensor. And that's a sensor that wraps around the plant. And then we put this insulation about it to uh, uh, make a good measurement. And uh, so uh, I have uh, Ciro there. And uh, so he'll show you some of the uh, requirements of the sap flow sensor and what he does to install that. So, Cyril, would you like to uh, go ahead with that? Sure. Yeah. And basically, this this here, a branch, uh, and the, the sensor is just one branch. Uh, 
and then we wrap around to protect the helmet, to protect the heat, uh, because you know we we put a little bit of voltage uh, on the branch uh, and uh, and by protecting the sensor from the element, we're able to get a better read. Uh, and that, I mean, that's why we put all this protective uh, shielding uh, around uh, around the branch. And also, what we do, we we uh, we uh, also protect it from the top and bottom because a lot of times, what we notice, especially in the summer, uh, it gets very hot. Uh, and if the sun if, it, like, if the sun is hitting right on the branch, uh, it might <coughs> interfere a little bit with the with the with the heat. So the heat is carried over and uh, it varies a little bit with our data. So that's why we protect it from top and bottom and at the sensor. So I'm gonna pass this one around. That way you guys can take a look at it and okay, Matt. Okay. <laughs> All right, so while you're uh, taking a look at that, and uh, uh, let's see, so w what we do is we take this data and we monitor it uh, with a, a data logger, and I believe there's probably one of those in the back of the room there that you can look at if you're interested. Uh, we take that information and transmit it to a website, and I'll show you some examples. And then we do the com communications back to the grower with a um, with a cell phone interface or directly to the uh, irrigation manager, and uh, that uh, information is available on on any laptop or or uh, internet device. Uh, so we do the uh, installation. We also keep the stems healthy. We do some maintenance to make sure that everything's uh, adjusted for the growth of the plant. So uh, uh, these uh, irrigation monitoring, these sensors work on uh, almonds, peaches. Uh, we've done it on citrus. And we have some very interesting uh, information on citrus. And we're working on many other crops. We've also been published, probably there's about 100 publications using the uh, DynaGage and the Exoskin sensors on corn, cotton, soybeans, a lot of other crops, and we're quite successful in viticulture, which is wine grapes uh, that's handled in by fruition uh, sciences in the uh, Napa and Sonoma areas. So we've also worked with kiwi and a few other uh, cherries and some other crops. So we're being able to adapt this technology and being able to use this, uh, this information. So here is the uh, radio, the transmitter, and the logger. Uh, this data logger transmits information to a gateway, which is basically a modem. It will transmit the uh, data set, the raw data, and then uh, we'll be able to report through an internet access what the water needs are, give you the plant stress. We can also do soil moisture and weather and ET. All right, so um, this shows an example of our uh, data set. This is data retrieved by agrisensors.net, and it shows the uh, the location, and you can see the, uh, uh, this is the uh, Ammon Field in Fresno, uh, and it shows the location of where the sensors are. This is on the east side, on the uh, west side, and then we also have some soil moisture monitoring here. And so we'll show the, uh, show the weather, we'll give the ET, and then a representative chart of sap flow in gallons uh, per, per, per day and other factors. So that's an example of how you would get to the data. Um, and this shows you, a, uh, I have about four or five slides that show you some real examples. Uh, these are started uh, data that started in uh, uh, 2015 on non-forel price. And these are zones that are, um, of course, managed by the CSU farm. And it shows data from uh, 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 through the uh, main part of the growing season from uh, June through September. And it shows the uh, application of the, of the plant where we're measuring certain uh, branches and we index that information to the entire tree. Uh, we also integrate the weather system. 
Uh, we use the ET from the Simis Weather Station, which is actually on site uh, on the Fresno campus. And then we also monitor soil moisture to validate the irrigation and basically to tell you is the, you know, is your fuel tank, uh, is it empty or is it full? You know, what's the status? But in fact, we're, we're using the daily water use to check uh, with the weekly irrigation schedule and to be able to correlate that to show the utility of the method. Uh, so here's some examples of water use. Uh, it actually shows you the daily sap flow in gallons per hour. And so you can see that these almonds, this is the uh, July 2nd, the coolest day of the year in, the, in July, and then the war some of the warmer days, showing that the plants are using about 10 gallons per hour. So this is 10 gallons. Uh, this is the east side, that's a little bit higher, it's also a little over 10 gallons. And you can see at night, transpiration goes down and then it shuts off uh, during the uh, 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 first part of the morning. All right, so we also take that information and um, uh, we are able to correlate that into a sap flow in gallons per day and then we're able to index that with the ETO, and you recall that formula that I showed. Showed you the KC, which is the crop coefficient. We also have KS, which is defined again by the Food and Agriculture Organization. The KS is the stress, which means the actual, this is the actual ET divided by that model. And it shows you that the model shows when it's well watered, we're at 0.6, so we're using about 60 to 70 percent uh, in, in August, and then we see that that goes down when the irrigation is stopped. And this example shows uh, when the harvest is occurring, and it also shows the stress level that's uh, realistic during the shutdown of the one week before, before the uh, trees are, are shaken and the, uh, and the almonds drop out. So this, this shows that particular week. And uh, I'll show you some other examples of that. Um, this shows uh, through the second, uh, through that first week, and it shows the sap flow, I'm sorry, it shows the soil moisture uh, at that point between the two, between the two harvests, there are two different varieties there. And it shows an, a sort of an emergency irrigation. It shows the soil moisture going up. And then at the end of the season, that soil moisture is increased to get the plants to recover. So it actually shows the, um, uh, a fair amount of uh, irrigation to recover uh, from, from that uh, dry down. Uh, let's see, so this uh, actually shows the sensors being buried. This is soil moisture that we use. Uh, they're buried underneath the drip zone. And uh, here's how they're installed. We see the sensors being buried. Uh, the drip zone is right over here. And so these sensors are buried and left in place. Uh, these particular sensors uh, don't require any maintenance. And there are also, they could be left in for 10 or 15 years. All right, so when we look at the uh, comparison of that, here's the soil moisture on the bottom. You can see between harvest, it gets really dry. Uh, the, the moisture level here, you probably couldn't see that from uh, the back part of the room, but it goes down below 10%, and it goes down to 7%. So you see that's really dry, and this is the average. So you can see between uh, wetted soil moisture and very dry, you do have, it's, it's a very small, it's a, it's a fairly small range. You have to be fairly accurate about that. But it shows the KS ratio. Here's the KS of a well-watered plant, so at about one on the uh, west side, it's about 0.7. You can see that declining uh, during, during that part of August 22nd through August 8th. Uh, this shows um, after the irrigation how those trees will recover. And you can see that the, the KS ratio gets from this yellow zone, uh, which, is a, uh, which is less than 
that's the green zone. So we're getting down to 0.25. In other words, the trees are using 25% uh, of their normal of their normal water use. So if they were using, let's say, 80 gallons per day, now they're down to about 20 gallons per day just because the water has been shut off. So we, we see that the stress level is very severe at this point, and we're below the red zone, and that's the time to start irrigation. Now, as it turns out, the trees were shaken here on the 18th. They were... Uh, uh, or at least the harvest was occurred on the 19th. They started watering on the 20th, and then the, the irrigation is boosted back up, and the transpiration is boosted back up. So um, now we know that the trees are still stressed, and there's some period of time when they will recover. They're actually at 52% of well-watered almonds. Okay, so this is... Uh, um, example of the almonds as they're as they're well watered, and you can see that this is the first week of September, and they do recover back to uh, 50 to uh, 80 percent of well watered, and so that's from irrigation that started on September 3rd, 5th, and 7th, and uh, sap flow increases to 0.5 ks. So this uh, this um, tells you the stress level in sap flow rate per hour. It does tell you the irrigation, so we're getting the plant biofeedback. It gives the uh, grower some intelligence to be able to schedule irrigation by a certain amount, knowing the amount of water that these plants are using. So it's not just how much to irrigate, but it's just when to irrigate and to be able to to uh, allow stress to actually take place and to be able to control that stress. So the idea is to take the information that we're getting to be able to re improve the recovery time and avoid losses to the tree and also to, uh, to be able to use this information to, to apply to d determine when to apply nutrients. So that's a, it's, it's a great way to conserve water and energy uh, we've shown that in some crops, and we have some references, uh, where on uh, uh, viticulture we've been able to save 40 to 100 percent. In other words, we're getting uh, situations in uh, grape growing where we don't need the water at all. So we can, we can save that amount of water by using the sap flow sensor to be able to analyze the stress and determine is it healthy or not, and then to be able to schedule the irrigation accordingly. All right, so uh, uh, that was my uh, last slide on the on the subject, and uh, uh, this is uh, uh, we're, we're certainly uh, part of the office here at the uh, Wet Center office, which is right next door to the building that you're in, and we certainly invite any uh, any of your questions at this point. So thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, this is David. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Um, I'm going to start the first question. So um, I know as a, a, a first off, I, I think you started your business in the research end, and these devices came out of research, and now they're being offered commercially. Is that correct? That that's correct. Yes. Yeah, we spent okay. about uh, 20 years in the research area, and um, that's where we've uh, uh, started the commercial application using this technology, uh, mostly in viticulture. Uh, about uh, about eight to nine years ago, and that's actually fairly successful. So now we're doing it with other crops, and we're applying the t same technology. Uh, so to do that, we had to do quite a bit of research to improve the method and to improve the, well, the ability to get information, actually. And so uh, I noticed you're sort of got three legs to the stool. You're measuring weather which uh, is an indice of crop water demand. You're measuring soil moisture, which again tells you perhaps how fast the plants are uh, picking up water and what's available. And then you're measuring the tree itself. Um, how do you integrate those three data points, and which one do you believe the most? Well, okay, so um, it, it depends on the crop, but for sure you do have to have the integrated weather report. 
and there, there's, uh, you, you do need to be able to monitor that either from a SIMA station or a station that's actually on the site and that would give you the ET. So uh, that would be the background telling us what the demand is. Uh, so secondly is the sap flow to be able to monitor what the plants are doing. And the reason why we say that I guess would probably rank it above the soil moisture area. Uh, we understand that you definitely want to monitor soil moisture. However, those uh, the, the trees themselves uh, may have moisture or lack of moisture, but it doesn't tell you what the plants are doing. So it's it's really a kind of a step level up. And then just one last question, and I'll let other folks jump in here. But um, obviously, as a manufacturer, you'd like to sell one of your sensors for every tree in the orchard, but that might be cost prohibitive. So what is the density of, of monitoring that, that you feel comfortable with uh, to provide reliable um, information? Well, what we do is we map the uh, most healthy trees and we would also uh, monitor a group of trees. So typically that's going to be two to four uh, uh, trees in one irrigation zone. So that, that particular zone may have a couple of our SAP IP monitoring loggers and would uh, report back to uh, track that particular zone. So that might be, you know, 15 to 20 acres. You may be monitoring two to four plants. So I would suggest if uh, people are doing uh, a monitoring a plant or an orchard that's never been monitored before, the idea might be able to get four plants at, at least to do a good crop coefficient. So I think um, uh, that may answer your question and the idea is you can uh, perhaps in the second season or to monitor in one season you can uh, monitor a number of irrigation zones and to be able to map that information for uh, to uh, be able to get those crop coefficients and use that to accurately project your irrigation. Okay, thanks Mike. Um, you want other questions? Uh, is, is the technology like mobile? Can you move it within the season from a different tree plot to a, another plot on the, uh, in, you know, in the uh, orchard? Yes, we certainly can. Uh, uh, it's it's actually uh, probably two weeks is a minimum amount of time to be able to map a particular part of the the uh, irrigation zone. I would say that because then you're going to get a ver variety of weather patterns. If you've got some cooler days, that, that um, crop coefficient can go up. On hotter days, it can go down. So when the plants are under more stress, you want to be able to map that accurately with the sap flow monitor. So, uh, so that would be one approach. And um, so the other, uh, I guess, you know, that, that would be sort of a minimum amount of time. I think what most people want to do is they want to monitor one crop through the entire season and then uh, because then you're going to be able to get that map that shows the uh, the initial crop water use, uh, when, when does the uh, crop really start to grow and use more water as well as the stress period. So, uh, but that information can be applied to other zones as well. So what you learn in zone A can also be used to project what you should do in zone B as well, even though it's not may not be the same schedule. Other questions? I have one. Sure. Yeah, um, Mike, this is Dave Farrell with Agri Natural Sciences. How effective or, or efficient is the actual monitoring of the nutrient needs for the plants? Uh, Dave, well, that's a very good question. The um, that could only be done over time, and what we what we're uh, being asked by some growers is, uh, when can I schedule my nutrients? I mean, it seems like every week there's something going on, or every other week there's something that's being applied through the fertigation. In other words, putting the nutrients or uh, 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 through the irrigation. Uh, 
through the irrigation lines. And so they're wondering, well, wh when's the best time to do that? And so we can do that by monitoring the irrigation, showing when that, uh, when the water and the nutrient uptake will be the greatest. So that's uh, one step. Um, over a secondary step, which I believe is what you're asking about, is well, when, when, if I am uh, reducing or if I'm uh, having a disease, how long would it be able to detect that? And uh, so, if it's if it's a problem with the root zone or if it's a problem with the leaves, um, uh, that that's a matter of real time. So it's just a matter of of taking the sap flow measurements, sort of equalizing the irrigation. And then determining uh, uh, if these plants are under stress or not. As a matter of fact, um, yeah. So there, there's there are a number of uh, areas where you can tell if if the plants are not um, responding to irrigation. Uh, what what is the actual problem with it? In some cases, it's a um, it's an issue with uh, a disease in the vascular system. So it takes more time, but it certainly can be done. Thank you. Uh, other questions, sir. Uh, this is David Latham. Have you taken any uh, measurements of measuring water quality? Uh, the higher the TDS, is that the strict time of quality? Um, David, I couldn't quite hear that question. Could somebody maybe closer to the uh, uh, please repeat that question. Yeah, uh, Mike, this is, um, the question was, does water quality affect the uh, sap flow, and can you detect that, the impact of, of water quality on the tree through sap flow measurements? I believe I understand that. And uh, so the, the biggest issue um, uh, that, that I'm aware of that uh, certainly has an uptake on water, on transpiration, is going to be the water is the salinity of that water, and uh, so that that would be directly determined, and you could measure that with sap flow. Now, to to be able to see that uh, live, uh, as you know, if the salinity goes up to a certain level, the plants are not going to uptake uptake that water. So that that would require that you would have uh, uh, a treated or you know, water that's uh, saline water versus water that's sort of pure, and that would allow you to determine that. Um, it's it's going to be uh, that that's probably the only example that I have on on water quality in mind, and I, and I know that's one effect that's that has a big impact, particularly in California, is, is the. Uh, salinity of that water, and as I recall, it does uh, change what crops you can, uh, what you can grow, depending on the ability of that of those uh, crops to stand uh, saline water. Okay. Any other questions? I got one last question for you, Mike. Uh, David again. Um, when you Place the uh, soil moisture sensors. Are those under the trees that you're actually measuring the sap flow? Or those need to be in tandem, or are those random to the field? Um, the soil moisture sensors were planted, I believe, between the rows of the plants that we were measuring. Uh, so we had four, uh, four depths that we were monitoring, and uh, I believe it was six inch, uh, one foot, two foot, and four foot. So those give us representative all the way through the root zone of the useful water that's being applied. And we see the most activity between the six inch and the one foot level. In particular, what we're trying to do there is, of course, at the, at the six inch level, we're monitoring as the water is applied, when, when does it apply, and does it actually make it to the next level down. And uh, we find that in some cases that water is just used up directly, and um, and so so we're definitely interested in tracking that and being able to uh, uh, see when the water when do you consider it well watered or not. Uh, part of that is to be able to determine uh, just what is the accuracy of your crop coefficient, not just to to determine when to irrigate, but to see when the plant. Um, 
uh, when it's really well stressed and what the levels are that would correspond to those uh, stressed plants. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions. We want to thank you for your time this morning, Mike. It was very good. All right. Well, thank you very yeah. much, Dave, and thank you to the group. Uh, we really appreciate you inviting us. And if you have any more questions, uh, Ciro is available to uh, or, or to give your uh, business card to him, and we'd be certainly glad to get back to you. Thanks a lot.